I know what initially drew you to him. Obviously, yeah. any of us would be swept off our feet. <laughs> right. But I'd love to hear a little bit about his personality. Yeah. You know, Jordan is the most charming, most magnanimous man you will ever meet. I mean, he is the consummate salesman. When he is on, he is on. And he's incredibly bright. And he made me feel like I was the only person in the world. And so he's very funny. So that's the great parts about him. But then the mask, when it falls, is the selfishness the lack of empathy and the rage. And so his personality, I would say, is one of extremes. When he works, he's like a grand symphony. And when he doesn't, he's like a natural disaster. His early therapist said those words to me. So let's get into it. I'd yeah. like to hear a little bit about the natural disaster. Yeah. Um, you know, during this time, I know you were finding yourself, you studied interior design, you started a maternity yeah. company. Yes. And here you are starting the foundation of this life you think you're going to live that's a fairy tale. Yes. When do the cracks start to show? You know, I think the cracks started to show very early on. I just wasn't aware they were cracks because of my naivete and my age. Uh, when we first met six months in, it was the threatening and the domination. If you're not going to marry me, I'm not going to date you. And I was like, okay, that's so strange. I'm just, I don't want to get married. I didn't want to get married because my parents had been divorced. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to wait till I was 30. So that was done. If you're not going to um, have children with me, I won't marry you. So the goalposts kept moving. And so there were early signs that I didn't know. I was like, oh, he just loves me. That's why he's doing this. But, you know, plowing through my boundaries and not hearing my needs at all doesn't make for a great relationship. Right. So that was the foundation. It, so it started very early on. What did it look like? So, I mean, other than just threatening you, yeah. totally threatening you. Yeah. I know there was physical abuse and there was just a tumultuous yeah. time. Yes. I'd love to hear a little more about it because I think it's important for people to understand. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the thing about, um, you know, when you're in a trauma bond, especially now, I didn't know I was in one back then. The person, Jordan especially, he could be so generous and helpful and kind. He really could be. I think when it suited him. But then on a dime, he could turn. And when he turned, or let's say I would confront him about his drug addiction, that's what we really fought about a lot, especially because here he was demanding I have children, then I have children, and he stoned all the time. So what kind of drugs was he doing? Quaaludes, Quaaludes. Quaaludes. I had a Manolo shoe bag of drugs mm -hmm. that he had, mm -hmm. not mine. Then if I would confront him about it, he would get extraordinarily rageful mm -hmm. and derogatory and insulting. I don't even want to say the words on your podcast, sure. you know, because um, they get all bleeped out. So then I would really begin to fear him. And I slowly lost myself yeah. because I couldn't give voice to my truth. He, I was no match for him. How old were you when you had your babies? So I was 23, I think, when I got married. And then I had my daughter at 25, my son at 27. But you're stuck, right? Because you oh, start yeah. to see this. And yeah. now you have kids. And now I have kids. I've heard the story about kind of the end of the end, which I believe was when he pushed you down the street. Yeah, he kicked, yeah, he kicked, kicked, kicked he kicked me. So so this, this, the movie doesn't really say it right. What happened was that I confronted him about his drug addiction. I said, I'm not going to sit here and watch you kill yourself. While all your friends who, they just look at you as a money train are watching you do this. And that's when he got very violent and threw my clothing and jewelry and lit them on fire. You're not leaving. Where, you know, where do you think you're going? That whole thing. And then he said to me, I'm going to take our daughter Chandler to Florida on a private plane. Now he's stoned out of his mind. And I'm like, no, you're not. And luckily my mom had told me, before you go home, please tell them you're going home to a domestic violence situation. And I did. And so as he was trying to take my daughter and I confronted him, he kicked me and my solar plexus down the stairs. But I was strong, I was 31. Ran up the stairs, dialed 911, hung up, chased him. And that's when he kind of that scene in this in the movie where he drives into the garage. She was okay because I said to my housekeeper, close the garage door so they can't leave. We got her. She took her to the back and then he got arrested. It's interesting that that's what kind of brought things to life because he was doing so much that was illegal. So if people haven't seen the movie, I, I'd yeah. love to catch them up on the fraud and stock market yeah. manipulation. Yeah. So he got arrested on 11 counts of money laundering. And so that's what he finally got arrested for. And that was, you know, a fun day when the FBI came to my house with the big FBI with the don't move. And that was the most, like, one again, a very scary day in my life. So what were you doing when that happened? Tell, like, walk me through that. Yeah, so I was home. Well, actually, my son had left his blanket at his 
at my friend's house. So I had driven to get his blanket. And when I came back, they were all in my driveway waiting for me. And so they brought me into the kitchen. He was in the, um, I think in his office and they were explaining to me what had happened. And the hard part was they arrested him, but nobody told me if this happens, this is what you should do. This is who you should call. So I was left alone with them for four hours while they grilled me unprotected. Ooh, so the FBI grilled you. They yeah. thought you knew. They they didn't think I knew anything, but they just wanted to see what I found out. You know, they had a woman there with me, and that was incredibly, incredibly scary, uh, as you could imagine. Uh, sometimes, you know, I tell these things so bluntly, mm-hmm. without emotion, but I just want your audience to know it's because it's 25 years later, okay. you know, and I've processed it ad nauseum in therapy. But trust me when I tell you, I was shaking. Yeah, I was shaking in my boots. It was absolutely horrible. And then he to get arrested. Then once he had the ankle bracelet on, that's when I left him. That was my freedom. Ironically, when he got his ankle bracelet, then I had my freedom because I knew he couldn't hurt me anymore. Right. And I felt safe. And it was so clear that he was the criminal and I was not. Because when you're dealing with someone that has a lot of money and power, I was always afraid to leave him because I didn't know how anything could get twisted. So now it was so black and white. And I was like, okay, I can leave. It's terrifying to think when somebody has money and power, what they're able to get away with so Correct. often. Correct. Uh, especially when there's a, a woman and a young woman involved. Yes. yes. You must I, have been terrified. I was terrified. And I mean, all we have to do is look in the news. I mean, we see abuses of power all day long. I mean, Puff Daddy mm-hmm. is... Right. Um, I just watched Quiet on the Set, which was an excellent documentary. Right. Yeah. And you have to remember, again, this was 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it was even worse. So I was smart, I think, in that sense to wait. I didn't know he was going to get an ankle bracelet and all that, but it was my ticket to ride. You know, I think it's so interesting because one of the things I talk about, I end up talking about a lot on this podcast is like that basically money doesn't equal happiness. Correct. And I as you did, it grew up around so many people with money who were so miserable. Yeah. And I'm wondering what, you know, because it sounds like a really scary existence, but here you are in this 10,000 square foot house and you have Bulgari watches and the yacht. Right. I'm sure a lot of people looked at you and coveted your life. Yes. What did it feel like being inside that? Was it confusing? Did you have moments where you're like, I'm so grateful for this life, but also this is just awful? Exactly. But then that's the cognitive dissonance that keeps the woman in the bond. Yes because I can't give this up, where would I be without him? Yeah, and it's like, I'm grateful, but I hate it. Mm. He's good and he's bad. Mm -hmm. Am I crazy or is he crazy, Mm. right? Is the relationship good or bad? And that's the cognitive dissonance that keeps a woman glued because, of course, I was grateful. You know, of course, there were moments where it was wonderful, but I always say, and I work with my patients with this, when the pain of staying is worse than the pain of going, then you know you really have a problem. And I just wanted myself back. You know, I didn't care about the money. I walked away with nothing. I literally took zero from him. Wow. How did that work? Well, you know, we he got arrested. We gave all of our homes. I gave back all of my jewelry. I could have asked for some of it back. I didn't want it. That meant nothing to me at this point. My freedom, my sense of self, my peace, my quality of life was all I wanted. So I was like, bye-bye. And it was all blood money. Mm -hmm. So why did I want money that had hurt people? Mm -hmm. Right? So I, with my moral compass, um, I just was like, bye, see you later. And I had my own company at the time. I started a maternity company. And um, I was happy to be free of that. Can you tell me a little more about kind of what blood money means to you? Like, how did his crimes affect people? What happened? Well, his his crimes affected people in the sense that his uh, brokers would cold call people and get money from them. But what was happening is they were manipulating the stock so much to make more money for themselves and for their friends. And I think they were calling older people, which I think was one of the reasons why they really got into trouble, because we know young and old people are a vulnerable population. So, you know, a lot of these people lost their retirement and lost their life savings. So I don't need a watch for those people (laughs) to lose their savings, right? So I was happy to get rid of it. I walked away with absolutely nothing. And I had, I always joke, I had my kids in my curtains. Mm. I could take some, like, and furniture, you know, but it was okay. And I was young. Mm -hmm. So I was hopeful still. 